So welcome back to this uh, third uh, lecture of this final and fifth module of the course uh, Knowledge and Data. This course is about data integration and knowledge integration and uh, this third lecture will uh, start focusing on the alignment and particularly on the alignment of ontologies and the reuse of them. So we have uh, seen in the past modules uh, that, that how to build uh, ex ex expressive knowledge sources and ontologies uh, and how to publish data on the web and now we want to combine the two but uh, this also means that you want to look at different conceptualizations of the world and how you can combine those. So this is the purpose of this talk. Um, so um, these were the questions that we have been looking into. What should information look like? How do we answer questions using this information? How can we make uh, knowledge specific and to prevent miscommunication? And now we're looking at how to connect and integrate different information sources. The next step will be how to build applications and we'll get to that later even in this module uh, but particular also then in the next three weeks to come. So remember that an ontology was a, a, a formal specification of explicit knowledge uh, about uh, a certain domain so it was not about building ontologies that would really be descriptions of the full world, general knowledge, complete and so forth, but it's only partial knowledge and it depends very much on the application, what kind of knowledge is useful and what, what information isn't. So it's a minimal ontological commitment um, th that is really meant for a certain knowledge sharing activity. Um, so now the question is if you have, uh, if you want to use data that was purpose built for some other purpose, and you still want to share the knowledge and the data, then what do we do with the, with the ontologies and the description of the world? So let's first look at what kind of uh, ontologies we might have out there. And on the one hand, we have the ontologies uh, in the proper sense of the word, like uh, the things we have modeled in our last week, where you really give a model theoretic semantics to the individual um, uh, concepts and instances and relations between those in terms of a set theoretic semantics. The other thing is that uh, we've seen the week before that you can even on a, on a slightly less expressive language uh, with a similar semantics uh, uh, do quite some, some uh, formalization of the vocabularies. But now I also want to say something about a slightly more, uh, slightly weaker uh, representation formalism, which is Tesaurus and taxonomies where you mostly agree on the meaning of some vocabulary in terms of relations or in terms of classes uh, because they, there has been a, a common agreement on those terms in the past uh, by a community. So if you look at the uh, bio portal, which is a, a huge collection of shared vocabularies in the biomedical domain, then you get a list uh, down here. You see a list of uh, SNOMAD and uh, National Drug File and MEDRA uh, NCI Tesaurus. It's all under one header ontology, but if you look at it in more detail, then uh, this one is also already called a Tesaurus, and this is a, 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 the clinical term SNOMAD is really an ontology in the in the owl sense. So here are uh, three examples in the bio portal and biomedical domain, which are really uh, subject headings, for example, the medical subject headings mesh vocabulary, it's Tesaurus, which just structures the concepts in a certain way. M-tree is a drugs and disease uh, um, vocabulary. Again, it's a tesaurus just to, um, to build hierarchies of concepts without a really formal semantics. And UMLS is probably the, diff, the biggest one which integrates 100 different vocabularies into one, but again, on a relatively shallow semantic level. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the cancer ontology from NCBI, the gene ontology, and SNOMED, which is a rather expressive uh, systematic nomenclature of medicine in, uh, from the uh, College of American Pathologists and it's a huge, huge collection of formally defined concepts and when I say formally defined concepts I really mean in the way of uh, a variant of OWL or, or something like this. So we have two different kinds of uh, specifying how, how, how much we know about relations of concepts in these uh, vocabularies and then we have to deal with this. And uh, there is not, nothing better than the other or, or, or worse than the other. It's just something different and we have to be aware of that. So 
I think for your for your final project, it makes a lot of sense to look into the Lincoln vocabulary, for example, which is a collection of um, um, of many different vocabularies, descriptions of those. I have to say, so uh, I I have the link here. I open the website, and then you get this nice diagram of different um, different vocabularies. And the bigger the the the, the, the bubble, the more often this vocabulary is used. And um, so DC terms is Dublin Core, one of the vocabularies I already described, I think, last week. And uh, if I click on it, then I get a description of what it is. So it is where is the URI, where are the terms described, what is the namespace. Uh, there is a home page which describes the vocabulary, the language it is in, the creator, the publisher, and so forth. Um, this is, uh, by the way, by coincidence or not, uh, this is Dublin Core vocabulary. Um, and you have a nice description of who uses this vocabulary and, and you can see that there is a huge reuse of vocabulary. So DC, ter DC terms is, for example, using four here in the little corner. And you can see the other way around. You can also see that um, DC terms is also defined in terms of other vocabulary. So DC terms, Dublin Core terms, uses four of to describe, for example, the people and their social networks. And if I go to uh, to four of itself, then I get a description of the friends of a friends vocabulary, and that is one that is meant to describe social networks. And um, so it's a project devoted to linking people and information using the web, and how these people are related among each other. And then again, you can see who uses four of, four and um, what other vocabularies are used in this uh, vocabulary. So you see there is a huge reuse of vocabularies and that makes it very powerful because we have some common understanding of what those terms in FOLV mean and what these terms in DC terms mean and so forth. We do not have a formal semantics though, so there is very little you can derive automatically by means of reasoning and inference. You have to explicitly query everything out of your, your database if you use those vocabularies. So what are these tesauri? They're really standard terminologies in specific domains. Often they are pretty wide, those domains. So you have libraries which order their books by topic, for example, and this ordering by topic is usually not in a set theoretic way, in a, in, in a, in a model theoretic way, but it's very often in terms of specializations of terms. So you have uh, books about uh, sociology, and then you have books about uh, um, uh, um, economic sociology, or and, and, and these are not subsets of each other. They are they are simply uh, concepts that gets more specific or more uh, broad or broader. So they are standard terminologies, very often used in, uh, in in libraries, for example, and in the library domain in general, or Yahoo taxonomy, for example. Uh, we also see them a lot on the web. They are often hierarchies without formal semantics, so taxonomies. And they have been developed over years and years, and they really are sort of knowledge that is in the heads of people that's implicit, and um, it's the it's hierarchies that can use, make use of, but there is not really much formal meaning attached to them. And some examples are the WordNet, it's a le lexical resource which relates uh, words of the English language by means of uh, relations such as hypermeme and, and hyponym. Um, the Getty Tesaurus, which describes art, art and architectures, geographic names, artist names, are also something that might be interesting for you to use, icon class, although I, th I think Getty might be um, uh, have rights restricted to get access to. Or, as I said before, the medical subject heading MESH. Um, so there are, in, in all possible domains, you find links, um, you find Tesauri to specify the knowledge. And SCOS now, the Simple Knowledge Organization Scheme, is a language for describing these uh, thesaurus relations on the vocabulary. So we talk about concepts in SCOS. A SCOS concept is, a, is, is really a subject to index things as opposed to a class of objects. So when you, when you talk about the subject sociology, then this isn't, isn't a description of all the things that are in, in uh, soci sociology, but they are an index on the description of, um, of objects that can be described with them. And then that means that a concept, a SCOS concept, may be both an instance and a class. So it's not so clear the distinction as we made in, in OWL. What you can then do is that you can make a distinction between concepts that are more specific than others, 
So you have a, a narrower um, relation and a broader. So we have Scott's broader relation and Scott's narrow relation. And this has no, um, or next to none, no formal semantics. So there is no reasoning we can do over it. We don't have inheritance and so forth. Um, a Scott's concept is a resource, an RDF resource, and it can have multiple labels. So in, in that sense, it reuses RDF and some of the power of it. And there are very handy things like uh, um, uh, Scott's member of Scott's collection, schemes. So all the things that you would need in order to organize descriptions in these kind of tesauri. So many of the vocabularies that you might re want to reuse for your final application, they can come in Scott's. So it's important that you know what it is, and if you follow this link, and uh, you, you see, uh, you get a guide to the core principles of SCOS. Here is an example where we say that um, we have a topic, animals that we talk about, and we have something that's more specific, and that's the birds. Um, so uh, in, in a way, you have a SCOS broader relation in one direction, uh, we have a SCOS mammals uh, ex, uh, and, and mammals relation, and then there we have a SCOS broader relation in the one direction and SCOS narrower in the other one. But this does not imply that all the animals, uh, that all the mammals are also animals. So this is a, is a far less strict commitment than a subclass relation. In a way, this is, is, is often similar, it often means the same. But this is a far less ontological commitment than using subclass of or owl equivalent class even. And then what you can do is that you give something a preferred label, you give something a, an alternative label, so you can refer to animals as animals in English or dieren in Dutch or beasts if you want to give it a sort of uh, more exciting name. Uh, here is something useful, you can just relate concepts by similar content, so you have birds on the one hand and often ornithology, um, and so forth. So SCOS broader is more generic than subclass, so there are things that are related in a SCOS broader relation that are not subclass of. Um, for example, in a mariological way, so part of, structural, location, membership, etc., but also topic implications, so cow milk can be brought under cows. So, and, and obviously cow milk isn't cow, so there is no, there is no subclass relation between the two. And these preferred and alternative alternate labels is something very useful. Uh, and the related thing is, uh, is symmetric, so that is one of the few things that you can really do inference over. But for the rest, broader, I believe, is not even transitive. But in a way, this is uh, um, less important when you, when you have so little formal semantics anyway. So now let's get to the question of reuse, how can we reuse the data, and that is basically a matter of ontology matching. And um, basically remember that we, when we have an application, that uh, we may need to make sure that people have the same understanding of what is meant by things. And if we just look at our own interpretation of the world, then we might have one object that we want to talk about our application, an, an elephant, we want to build something about an elephant. And then if you are blind enough, you only see the, the tail and you only see something which you think is a, is a wall or it's a tree, trunk, um, and so forth. So in a way, we need to combine all our, our views on this animal, on this elephant, in order to get to a common understanding that, oh yeah, this is an elephant and we need to build, I don't know what, for, for this elephant. So the aligning the ontology, aligning the view that we have on the world is really critical and crucial for data integration. Um, and this is what this uh, next uh, thing, next part of the lecture is all about. What uh, we should be careful about is what, uh, what Tim Berners-Lee already pointed to in his lecture on, on uh, with the bag of crisps, that there is nobody who claims that there is a unified vocabulary for everything, so that we can all as humans agree on one view of the world no, that's not the case. Nobody claims that anymore who's serious about this. But we have loads and loads of small problems, and for those we build ontologies. And the more we, we work hard, we, we can maybe get agreement on bigger pictures. So these, the SNOMAD ontology for the medical domain is, is a, a huge effort over the past 20 years or more to agree upon 
definitions of formal, formal uh, concepts in the medical domain. But um, uh, in, in many cases, this is very difficult. And, and even for, the, for small things, the same things, it can easily be that um, th th there are different ways of looking things. So these ontologies, they might be partially overlapping in multiple languages, and they might have their own perspective. So for the one the person, uh, it's an elephant, and for the other one, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a big gray thing. The semantic web does not solve this. The technology that we've seen doesn't solve this. It just gives us a means to make the difference explicit. So if we have a formal definition in, in OWL, then we can really make sure that we understand what the difference is. And we can express how these views are related and how to relate them in, in our application. Here's then where the task of ontology merging and ontology alignment starts, namely where we have a process to uh, derive semantic mappings between classes and properties of two or more ontologies. This is then called alignment, so you align the classes with each other and the properties with each other. Merging is then when you build one ontology out of two, so you, you basically build one new coherent ontology that has no uh, contradictions and that integrates both views of the world into one single view. The task is very similar. So you need to find links between the concepts in the, the source and the target ontology. The source code ontology is then uh, the, the one where you start looking for, and uh, then you, you find either one or two or, or many different concepts that are related in the other ontology. Uh, and that means that basically the knowledge that is encoded in the one ontology can be used in the other ontology. Uh, and by this, of course, the data that is related to, to one of these ontologies can then be used by the other data, uh, together with the other data that has been annotated with the other ontology. So this really allows you to get access to data from different collections and across uh, applications. The question is now, how do you get those ontology alignments or emerge ontology and that depends very much on the ontology type um, it also depends very much what kind of relations you can derive and that depends really on, on the type of ontology that you have and that you want to express as you can imagine these mappings should also be formalized again so they should really be semantic relations so what are the different types of relations we could think of we could link individuals with individuals and then we can look at formal definitions, in, in, an, in, in this case, we are now really looking at our mappings, so mappings with really strong semantic relations. And then we look at individual to individual mappings, which could, we could say as same as. So two individuals are the same if they are same as. We can also state relations between individuals by saying that they are different objects. That's also uh, something very useful. And we can use inverse functional properties um, to state that individuals are the same. For example, if I inverse functional property would be, for example, my, um, my mother. So if I know that the mother of someone is an inverse functional property, that implies that there can be only one object, one such object, such object. My mother would be a good example because there's only one person. So if I state that this woman on the left-hand side is my mother and this person on the right-hand side is my mother on two photos, for example. Then this implies, if it's an inverse functional property, that these two individuals are the same. So on this photo, I see twice my mother. So that's why inverse functional properties can be very useful. If I now want to express the, the relation between two classes in OWL, I have the means to say uh, that two classes are equivalent, but also subclass is a, is a very interesting way of mapping two concepts into different ontologies. And even saying that they are not the same can be very useful in practice. I can map, of course, individuals to classes. So if I have somewhere a database that is about Amsterdam, then it would be very useful to map it automatically or semi-automatically to a database that uh, a knowledge ontology that uh, tells us um, uh, what objects are. Uh, we can relate properties by the standard sub-property of or equivalent property or disjoint property that we've seen in OWL. And for the real lovers, we can also do uh, relations between properties and uh, classes and instances and so forth. The question now, of course, 
is um, how to derive these mappings and alignments. And um, there has been a lot of research over the past 20 years again to automatically or semi-automatically map vocabularies and ontologies. So um, there are many semi-automatic tools now that are available. And um, I, I think it's overkill for you to look too much into this, um, this matter because you will probably work with a relatively small ontology uh, and, and mapping it by hand might be a, a, a better solution. But of course, if you really want to combine a, a, a medical thesaurus of 200,000 concepts with something else, then this has become something that is needed, uh, where automation is needed. So one thing you can do is syntactic, syntactic comparison of the labels or the URIs even. And uh, there are techniques such as the added distance, Levenstein distance is something that uh, you might have heard of, which really counts the operations to transform one word into another. So you count the deletions and you count the additions to a word and the changes of letters so that you get from one word to another. Uh, then there is the, the way of looking in, into language processing technology. Tokenization means that you, you only take the, 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 the word, single words or you put words together. You can remove singular, plural and these kind of things. But you can also look at lexical resources such as synonyms, homonyms. Uh, WordNet is a, is a very powerful tool for that. Uh, but this is, as I said, this is a, a field of research in itself. Another way of doing is structural comparison. So if you have common parents in a taxonomy or common children in a taxonomy, then this might be an indication that this is a, a related concept. And um, the same if you find common patterns in, a, in the relations for a taxonomy or in a graph. So if you have a, a knowledge graph, then you might have this, if you have a similar graph structure and even uh, the number of incoming links, if you have a highly connected node in this graph, then this might be similar to the, the, the high, most highly connected uh, nodes in, in, a, in a different ontology. Uh, so you look at all the possible arguments for two things to be comparable uh, if you do this, uh, this automatic alignment. And there's a, a final um, possibility, and that's instance-based comparison, that you look at the instances of the class uh, to make them similar. So if you, for example, uh, have a two library uh, tesauri which describe books and you see that the books are the same that these two things compare, uh, describe, then uh, this might indicate that the two terms in these two tesauri is the same. So what do you do when you have such mappings? You have to really be sure w whether they are really correct and you have to evaluate them. So you always have a, if you do, particularly if you do automation, but even if you do only uh, by hand, uh, you need to check uh, that what you did is correct. So you can judge individual links and that is usually what you do for precision. So you go through the whole list of, uh, of matches that you found in one example you found bank and that's the scos exact match to sofa and that is probably a good one if you if you you work in the domain of furniture if you work in the financial domain this is probably a bad one so it's, it is very difficult and if you look at uh, things that you that might be similarly spelled then the couch and the crouch are probably not related so you really have to go through all the individual uh, triples that that build your mapping between the ontologies and uh, decide whether they fit, uh, whether they're correct or not. And by the, the ratio, precision is the ratio of the correct matchings uh, as opposed to the entire set of matches returned by your system. An alternative to evaluate is that you compare to reference alignment. So you take a gold standard that's uh, manually created by an expert. The expert says, okay, a bank is a sofa is the same or, uh, um, um, or not. And then you automatically compare what you what you did yourself with your generated alignment, and this uh, gives you a measure for precision again because you can compare how many of the expert created mappings did I get correct, and um, how many of them are correct, and how many of the correct ones did I get. So that's two different uh, things that you normally then evaluate in uh, ontology alignment. Um, you can also compare the logical entailments of the model. So do you get the same things out of your, your reasoner, reasoner? And in the end, another thing you can do is an end-to-end -end evaluation by using the alignment in an application and see what comes out. So now it's up to you to start 
do some import import uh, ontologies and see whether you can align them. And there is a nice video from uh, a screencast from uh, Rinke that you can start with uh, on Vimeo. And uh, I suggest you start uh, watching that and then um, I give another example for how to align data. So this is what you happen when you click on this and uh, have fun with uh, Rinke's explanation. So again, we use a protege here um, and uh, that should work. Obviously, we can also map between Tesauri. So this was what I just showed was a mapping between ontologies and um, uh, what kind of uh, matches we can give between objects if they are specified in a formal language such as OWL. But we can do the same with mappings between Tesauri. So if we have, for example, one on the right-hand side, the green one, which expresses a relation between mammals and the broader uh, topic of uh, that is part of a topic of, for example, in the library, um, and we have a certain element with the petals arrows in, in, a, in a Scott's broader relation to topics of, say, for for example, a book, a description of a book, um, and we have another ontology which is about um, which is about um, animals and mammals and so forth. Uh, then we can uh, state relations between these objects in Tesauri using SCOS vocabulary again. And the SCOS vocabulary is in this case, for example, SCOS exact match or broader match. So exact match that these are really supposed to mean the same concepts in SCOS. Whereas this one is a broader match, like this one is a broader relation between elements in one ontology, one Tesauris, and this is a match between different objects in different ontologies. So in this case, you would use the broader relation between objects in the same vocabulary and a broader match relation between the mammals in this case and animals in this case. And we have a close match, which is something that is uh, not an exact match. So we have more specific ways of describing the relation between objects.